Good morning. I'm Russell Miller, one of the pastors here at First United Methodist Church in Bernie. It's my privilege to welcome you to worship today. Today we're going to be looking at a passage from the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus gives his disciples their very first set of instructions before sending them out into the community. We'll look at what Jesus asked them to do and what Jesus might be asking us to do. I hope you'll find this time of worship meaningful. So let's prepare for worship. You might want to make sure your space is ready with a cross or a Bible or some item to focus on. And let's make our hearts and spirits ready too as we take a deep breath and invite the Spirit to come in. I'm Ricky Burke, senior pastor here at First United Methodist Church of Bernie. And first of all, I want to invite you to complete registering the group you're with today. 
And then in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to greet one another, pass the peace of Christ. Uh, and as you're doing that, I want you to keep uh, your eyes on the screen at home. Uh, this, because this last Wednesday, we had a celebration of our confirmands. We gave them their quilts. Uh, it was a wonderful time of fellowship. Now, take just a moment to greet one another with a wave or a smile. And always remember, you can send a text to someone you know who needs your love and encouragement. Good morning, church. My name is Rachel Latimer. I'm the contemporary worship leader here. This morning, as we prepare to worship in song, let's take a look and celebrate our confirmands this year.
Hi, I'm Lori. I'm one of the pastors here at FUMC Bernie. And today as we come together in prayer, I invite you to pay attention during the prayer as you're hearing these words and see if God isn't bringing someone to your mind that you can be in prayer for. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, when you walked here on earth, you met people right where they were in the midst of their hurts, their pain, their doubts, their anger. In your healing presence, you brought a taste of heaven to earth. And now you call us as your disciples to participate in your ministry of healing. May we be open to your presence and guidance as we care for others. Our prayer today is that our world will know your healing touch and your forgiving heart. That those of us who have been hurt by insincere actions and harmful words will hear your healing voice that those of us whose lives are filled with dark thoughts, deep shame, or deep fears will know your peace. Walk beside those of us who are close to giving up hope, those of us that struggle to make ends meet, and those of us who fear for our safety. May your justice, your peace, and your mercy replace our injustice, our anger, and our desire to be right soften our hearts and allow us to reflect your heart to the world. May those of us living with illness and injury feel the touch of a caring hand. And may those of us who mourn, feel abandoned or unloved, turn towards your voice, move towards your arms and hear the whisper of your presence in the midst of darkness. May we support one another without judgment that all will know your love. Lead us with grace, with love, with peace. Inspire us and encourage us to embrace those for whom society has no time or patience, for these too are your children. Transform us in your image, in your son, in your name. Transform us to grow, to understand, to see. Transform us that we may be made whole and in wholeness, may we be the hands and the heart of Christ. We ask all these things in the merciful name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now would you join me as we read together the prayer of illumination. Eternal God, in the reading of the scripture, may your word be heard. In the meditations of our hearts, may your word be known. And in the faithfulness of our lives, may your word be shown. Amen. The scripture passage for our sermon today comes from Matthew chapter 9, beginning with verse 35 and continuing through chapter 10 and verse 8. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest, to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, 
Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello there, it's time for a conversation again with our youngest disciples. So I invite you kids to grab your favorite toy, a friend, your little sister, whatever you want, and meet me right back here. Hi there and welcome. Last week I read a book to you, this book called God's Dream. It was a book that reminded us about how God's dream is for everybody on the planet to share with one another, to care for one another, and to help bring about God's dream of a, of a beautiful place. I've been thinking a lot about how I might help God's dream come true, and this week I want to ask you if you can do that too. I heard a story this week about a girl named Chelsea. She's 10 years old and she lives in Connecticut. And Chelsea loves art. She likes to draw and paint and create. She uses it to help her feel better whenever she's feeling sad. But she also likes to use it to help her express her happy times too. So when Chelsea had her 10th birthday, instead of asking for people to bring her a gift, she asked people to bring art supplies that then could be sent to other children who don't have access to art supplies. Well, her friends did so, and so have lots of other people. And I understand that by now, Chelsea has sent over 2,000 kits of art supplies to kids all across our country to give them something to do to help them feel better. I think Chelsea is doing her part to help make God's dream come true. It sounds like a pretty big deal that she's doing. I think it really is, and we can't all do everything on such a grand scale like Chelsea's doing, but all of us can do something. And so what I want you to do this week is to think about what you could do to help bring a little joy, a little happiness to the world around you. Maybe it's drawing pictures that could then be sent to the nursing homes where some of those residents haven't been able to have visitors for quite a while. Or you could do something kind for your next door neighbor. There are about a million different things you could think of to do. And once you figure out what it is, I would love for you to email me, text me, put it on Facebook some way so that I know what kinds of things you're doing to make this world a better place and I can share your ideas with others. Will you do that for me? I hope so. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Help us love you and love each other. Show us ways to help this world be more like your very best dream. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to make you aware of something really important that happened in the life of our church this week. On a normal year, your clergy and some of your lay delegates would be in Corpus Christi right about now. We would be having our annual gathering that we call annual conference. But due to the coronavirus, that has gotten postponed and canceled for the most part. However, this week, over 300 clergy in our conference gathered together via Zoom to take care of some important business. And one of the things that we did was to overwhelmingly approve Pastor Lori Bolensiefen to be a deacon in full connection with the Rio Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church and to be ordained. She was overwhelmingly approved for that. 
a normal year it would mean that the ordination service would happen within just a couple of days. But again, that has been postponed because of the virus. But the stole that you see on the altar today is Lori's stole um, that she will be able to wear as a, as a fully ordained person in our community. And I just want you to celebrate that with her. So let's start today with a bit of irony. Today begins a new season of the church year. In the liturgical calendar, we call this time of year ordinary time. We've gone from the reds of Pentecost and the whites of Trinity Sunday to the greens of ordinary time, as you see on our altar today. The green color represents growth and change. Ordinary time actually happens twice every calendar year, but this is the biggest chunk of it, and this section is going to take us all the way until the beginning of Advent. The irony is, is that these times seem anything but ordinary, don't they? Now, to be fair, the word ordinary in this context doesn't actually mean usual or routine. It actually refers to the number of Sundays in between now and the time the next season begins, and we count them using ordinal numbers. The first Sunday of ordinary time, the second Sunday, and so forth. But the purpose of this time is to support individual disciples and whole congregations of disciples as they live out the gifts and the callings that they might have discerned during the season of Easter and that were commissioned on Pentecost and on Trinity Sunday. So last week, Ricky preached about the Great Commission. That was the final set of instructions that Jesus gave to his disciples before he ascended into heaven. So let's take a review quiz, shall we? I hope you were paying attention. There were three primary things that Jesus told the disciples to do as part of the Great Commission. Do you remember what they were? Make disciples, baptize, and teach. And they were instructed to go out to all nations, go into the whole world to do those three things. We might imagine that as Christ's disciples, that is our calling to do as well. And frankly, it's pretty daunting if you think about it. Interestingly, today's text assigned to us intentionally by the lectionary readings, that cycle of readings that we use, takes us back, back from Jesus' last set of instructions to his disciples to Jesus' first set of instructions. To do this, we're going to go backwards in the Gospel of Matthew, nearly 20 chapters from the Great Commission. Now, during those 20 or so chapters, the disciples have been following Jesus around, hearing his teachings, watching, and even participating in some miraculous events and healings. And they've witnessed Jesus' death his, and his resurrection. It's also important for us to know what happened in the nine chapters before today's text. Well, there was a birth narrative, Jesus' baptism and temptation, a famous set of teachings that we call the Sermon on the Mount, and quite a number of healings. And after all of that, Jesus calls the 12 disciples together and he gives them their first set of instructions. And here it is. Go to the lost sheep of Israel and proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven is near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons. And oh, by the way, you're going to do it all for free. Let's look at the differences between this first commission and the great commission that comes later. Now, there's nothing in this first one about making disciples, baptizing, or teaching. Teaching especially is apparently reserved for the master himself. It's not until Jesus ascends into heaven that the disciples are charged to take up that task. And just as an aside, you've probably seen the meme on Facebook that says that when Jesus ascended into heaven, that's when he started working from home. But I digress. No, the only thing the disciples are called to do seem to be healing kinds of ministries, curing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing lepers, and casting out demons. Wow. In some ways, that sounds even more daunting to me than making disciples, baptizing, and teaching. But it is in those acts of healing that the disciples can demonstrate the veracity of their claim that the kingdom of heaven really has come near. That's how people will know that it's true. Another big difference is that Jesus specifically instructs the disciples to do this first healing work at home, among the lost sheep of Israel, not among other Gentile nations. And then finally, it's important to note that at this point, the disciples have now become apostles. This is the only place in Matthew's gospel where he uses the word apostle. 
A disciple means a learner or a student, but an apostle means someone who is sent out. After watching Jesus teach and do lots of healings, it's time for his students to now go out for some field work on their own and to do the things that they have watched Jesus do. All this leads me to believe that our first step as disciples has to start at home. It begins right here where we live and where we work and where we go to school. So we don't start by being missionaries to Africa or some foreign land or by preaching to thousands of potential converts, but by doing healing ministry right here. I already alluded to the fact that in some ways this healing ministry seems more challenging than the teaching and making disciples part. Even those of us who tremble in our boots at the idea of public speaking may be even more put off by the idea of raising the dead and casting out demons. Now, I certainly know that I have no skills or training in the healing arts, at least not the physical ones. When our children were young, I was the dad who, when it came time to pull a loose tooth, had to leave the room and go put my head between my knees. Sorry, Sylvia, you're going to have to take care of this one. Me, a healer? Maybe you can relate. But there are lots of needs for healing in this world, and there are lots of ways to bring about healing. And so let's talk about that today. First, if we go back to the beginning of this passage, we see that Jesus went about teaching, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. And here's why. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Later, Jesus would refer to himself as the ultimate shepherd, the good shepherd, the shepherd who would leave the 99 sheep who were safe and go rescue the one sheep who was lost and in danger, the shepherd who would willingly give away his life in order to save the lives of his sheep. And all of this stems from this deep sense of compassion. And that word compassion has its roots in the word that means guts, even bowels. Jesus' compassion came from the very depths of his being. It's a strong emotion, not just a nice feeling. Have you ever felt that kind of deep compassion for another person or for any other part of creation that was in pain or in danger? I'm going to claim it was compassion, certainly not fear, that sent me out of the room at tooth pulling time. I don't know if I can make Sylvie believe that, but that's going to be my story. I'll stick to it. But I am realizing that I have had some of that same depth of anguish just listening to the news lately. Have you? Is there any doubt that there are still people who are harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd? Our world is calling upon us to find compassion that comes from our guts, from the very depths of our being. Compassion for people who are sick and dying of a virus. Compassion for people who are suffering inhumane treatment and even death just because of the color of their skin. Compassion for families who grieve the loss of those they love because of either of those other causes. Might these be some of the demons that we are called to be helping cast out? How can the healing actions we take help proclaim the good news that all is not lost, the kingdom of heaven really is near? I think it's clear in this passage that Jesus gave these disciples turned apostles spiritual authority to do this miraculous work of healing. They seem to have been given some superpowers, and maybe we don't feel like we have those same powers and authority. How in the world are we supposed to heal and cure and cast out demons? It turns out, I think, that the answer is surprisingly simple, and I know it's going to sound cliche, but the surprisingly simple answer is love. That's our superpower, and I think I can prove it. This past May, I officiated at two weddings. Both of them had been scheduled to be large family gatherings and beautiful hill country venues. But due to the coronavirus, both of them ended up being very small, very intimate gatherings in our chapel, with only the closest of family in attendance. At both of those weddings, I used that famous passage from Paul's letter to the Corinthian church. We call it the love chapter. I usually shy away from 1 Corinthians 13 for weddings, not because it's not beautiful, it is, but because it just seems overused for such occasions. We hear it, and it's so familiar, we don't really hear it. 
But through the lens of the way our world is these days, it's taken on some extraordinary new dimensions for me. So hear that passage now in what may be some of its most familiar wording. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. There's another passage in 1 John chapter 4 that says this, Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. And this is the critical part. For God is love. So if God is love, then we can go back to 1 Corinthians 13 and insert the name of God every time it says love. God is patient. God is kind. God is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. God does not insist on God's own way. God does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. God bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I have to tell you that the first time I heard that connection being made, it kind of rocked my world a little bit. But hang on, because I want to add one more thread to this. One of my favorite theologians is Franciscan Father Richard Rohr. And he speaks about being made in the image and likeness of God because that's the language used in the first chapter of Genesis, verse 26, where it says, Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. Now we could talk about that plural language for God, but that's for a different day. Rohr goes on to suggest that the image of God and the likeness of God are two different things. To be made in the image of God is a characteristic and it's a quality that we share with all humans everywhere and at all times. Each of us is born with some divine DNA inside of us. Some have called this our original blessing. It's not something we can choose or control. It's a gift and it's given to us at our conception. Likeness of God, on the other hand, is how we use our unique and individual personalities, our gifts, our talents, our passions, to express that divine DNA. It's the way in which we consciously or unconsciously reflect that image of God in which we were made. So here we go. So if God is love, and if we were made in the image of God and have some divine DNA in us, then can we go back to 1 Corinthians 13 and insert our own names? Ricky is patient. Ricky is kind. Lori is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Karen does not insist on her own way. Rachel is not irritable or resentful. Sylvia does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. You see, love is our superpower, and we've had it all along. But it's the thing we need most as disciples of Jesus now turned into sent out to apostles who have been given this task of healing our world and showing that the kingdom of God is not far away. I think it's also important to note that these apostles were not sent out individually, but they were sent out in groups. They were sent to work together in their healing work. We too are called to work together with one another in our home place to heal the world around us. You know, there are lots of things that can get in the way of our healing work. Things that annoy us or irritate us or make us angry or cynical. For some, it's having to wear a mask or sit in a sanctuary with blue tape that keeps us from getting too close to one another. For others, it's bigger than that, like a dip in income because hours were cut at work or having to try to work from home and care for children at the same time because schools and childcare centers and summer camps were canceled. For still others, it's huge stuff like injustice or racism or violence or hunger or poverty Whatever it is, it needs healing. And it's our calling to do all we can to cure those diseases, to raise up the good things that maybe we thought were dead, cleanse those leprous, infected places in our society, and cast out those demons that threaten to tear us apart. So apostles, are you ready for your first assignment? 
The harvest is plentiful, Jesus says, but the laborers are few. Therefore, let us ask the Lord to send us out as laborers. Let's pray. Lord God, we confess that the work of healing our world is hard and difficult and challenging and at times overwhelming. But we are your disciples and we pray for strength to do this work that only you can provide for us. May what we do bring healing and wholeness to the broken places around us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Today we're going to respond to God's word with God's word. Now the words we're going to say together may sound familiar. They'll be familiar to most of you as it's the love passage from 1 Corinthians 13. However, we're going to read from the message paraphrase today in the hopes that hearing these words phrased slightly differently may breathe new life and new power into them. Please join me. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never dies. As we prepare for communion, it's always my joy to remind us that this is an open table. That means the invitation is open to all. So if you're watching this and you're not a member of a United Methodist Church, I still want you to feel comfortable to partake of this bread and juice that you have available, whatever you have, just feel comfortable to partake of. When Christ shared this last meal with his disciples, during the course of the meal, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And showing it to his disciples, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. As he came to the end of the meal, he took the cup and pouring it. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink, and as you do, remember me. May we pray. Loving God, we ask that you pour out your spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we may be for him the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Now, let me invite you to partake with us. The body of Christ given for you. And the blood of Christ poured out for you. Now may we pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we come to the end of the service, we always want to give you an opportunity to respond to what God has placed upon your heart. Uh, one opportunity that's just around the corner will be our children's VBX. You can begin registering for that uh, June the 21st. So stay tuned for more information from our children's director, Rebecca Sweet. We also want to give you the opportunity to respond 
financially. And you can do that by text, by our new giving app, and also by clicking on the Give button on the church webpage. And this information should be on the screen as we're talking about it. Now, let's take a moment and pray. Gracious God, all that you have given us is yours. We ask that you take this, give it increase as only you can do to bring the kingdom of heaven to others. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
And now hear this benediction. Will you go from wherever you are, armed with your superpower of love and strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit to heal the broken places around you? Go in peace. Amen. You can begin registering for that online. Uh, Let me start over. notice who God might be calling to mind that you could be in pray for in prayer for okay can we try that again